Michelle Gillespie, who was R.J. Reynolds? R.J. Reynolds was one of the original tobacco manufacturers in the United States uh, in the late 19th century. He was selling chewing tobacco, and he became the best manufacturer of chewing tobacco in the entire country. How did he become that? He became that because he was the son, the second son out of 16 children of a tobacco planter before the Civil War who owned uh, over 50 slaves, the largest slaveholder in Patrick County, Virginia. He lived in Kreitz, his father lived in Kreitz, Virginia. And so R.J. Reynolds grew up before the Civil War, born in 1850. Uh, and learned the whole, the whole business of growing tobacco um, from his father. And his father also was entrepreneurial and pretty shrewd and recognized that it's great to grow tobacco, but it might be even better to sell that tobacco himself and to process it, to manufacture it. And so he took that tobacco and he created on his own plantation uh, a manufactory. And he had his slaves and his sons figure out how to turn the tobacco plant into chewing tobacco. And so he was selling chewing tobacco um, before the Civil War. And after the Civil War and during the period of Reconstruction, he had his sons continue learning this business. Um, so his father was very entrepreneurial, figured out that it, you were losing money in the tobacco trade over the course of the middle of the, the 19th century, in the end of the Civil War, the beginning of Reconstruction, and taught his sons how to do this business. His sons, particularly R.J. Reynolds, realized, though, that that plantation was too far away from marketing uh, possibilities, that you, if you're going to sell this tobacco, you couldn't do it the old way. The old way was to get into wagons and take the chew, this big chaw of tobacco, this big kind of brick of, chew, of chewing tobacco, and head into the Appalachian Mountains, go down the backbone, the shoulder of those mountains, and sell them, sell this tobacco to the people who lived in the hollows and lived in the valleys. Uh, and he would send, R.J. Reynolds' father would send his sons out to do this. R.J. Reynolds learned how to do this uh, and came back. Well, his son realized that, you know, that made some money, but it was not a very smart way to market, to sell. He realized that the future lay in railroads and having close access to railroads and bigger efficiencies of scale. So when R.J. Reynolds was uh, a, a teenager after the Civil War, he went to Baltimore. And in Baltimore, he studied accounting. He went to uh, kind of a night school for accounting. But what he really did in Baltimore as a young man was to learn how business worked the business, the modernizing of that period. How did he end up in North Carolina? He ended up in North Carolina because he came back from Baltimore and he looked at his father's uh, plantation and sort of small scale manufacturing and he said, I'm going to work for you a little bit longer, Dad. He worked for his father a little bit longer, saved up money. His father paid him for his part of the share. And he realized that the golden leaf tobacco market was probably going to be best served a little bit south of where he was in Patrick County, Virginia. So he moved to Winston, North Carolina. It was a tiny little town in the 1860s, 1870s, a couple thousand people. But because of its location, there were tons of young, uh, young brash men like himself who realized that this golden leaf tobacco that people were just beginning to grow along the North Carolina and Virginia border uh, was, was gold in their pocket if they could bring it into a warehouse and even better yet, if they could manufacture it. R.J. Reynolds was one of those dozens and dozens of young men who arrived in Winston. He came in 1875. He had the equivalent of about 70, well, he had about $7,500 at the time, which is probably about $140,000 in, uh, in today's money. And he took that money, bought a lot, and he built a small brick warehouse that he turned into a tobacco manufactory on it. And he was so cheap that he slept upstairs in the manufactory, and he credits his early beginnings to about a dozen African-American men who worked with him to make that tobacco manufactory work. Uh, in the beginning, in 1875, he really was one of dozens of other men like him, setting up these warehouses, setting up early manufactories of tobacco. Uh, but um, pretty quickly, he figured out that uh, he could do some, some changes, some innovations that other people weren't thinking about. He bought a steam engine, 
and he was able to provide light all through the winter. So he was able to manufacture through, through the short days uh, and th or the long nights and the short days. So he was able to produce faster than anybody else was. He also looked around this little town of Winston, North Carolina, about 60 miles south of the border, and he said, this town's gonna be big someday. And he pushed to get, uh, to get an extension of the train service to Winston, to Winston. He also bought up land all over the place. And, um, and he bought land for commercial reasons, he bought land for private reasons, he bought a farm, he pressed for public utilities, he ran for city council. He really decided he was gonna make this place work and, uh, and put all of his sort of heart and soul into making Winston grow and prosper. So pretty quickly he emerged, as his uh, younger brothers like to say about him by the 1880s, the biggest blood in the town of Winston, that he was doing very, very well commercially Commercially, he was doing very, very well with his manufacturing. He was um, buying tobacco from tobacco farmers counties away who were selling to him exclusively. He had a big personality um, because probably he had gone into the mountains to sell that tobacco as a very young man. He learned how to talk to anybody, anybody and everybody. And that carried over into his transition from this agricultural world to this new manufacturing world that he was in charge of. Uh, so he could talk to the farmers, he could talk to the African-American men who had come from the countryside to work for him, he could talk to middle-class families, and um, some of the more well-to-do families loved to have R.J. Reynolds uh, come to their weddings. Uh, so he was a very personable, very ch a charming guy that everybody seemed to like and everybody wanted to be attached to. Um, by the 1890s, his tobacco manufacturing was so successful that he probably was the, the largest manufacturer of chewing tobacco in the country by the 1890s. When did cigarettes come into vogue? R.J. Reynolds was actually really slow on making the transition to cigarettes. Cigarettes had become popular by the mid-century, by the mid-19th century in Europe. And James Buchanan Duke and the whole Duke family, who were in Durham, North Carolina, so about an hour, in today's time, an hour and a half away, uh, were very quick to make the transition to cigarettes. Uh, the Dukes were the first to buy the manufacturing machinery that you needed to make cigarettes, the Bonzac machine. And so they were manufacturing cigarettes. R.J. Reynolds was slow on this. For someone who ended up being very innovative in the early 20th century, he was kind of behind the times in the late 19th century, perhaps because he was so successful at cornering the chewing tobacco market. Uh, he, was, he had about 40 different brands that he would uh, affix his labels on, everything under the sun. He was a marketing genius. He seemed to have everybody's, you know, everybody's market. So he didn't really feel a burning desire, burning desire as it were, sorry, uh, to make that transition to, to cigarettes. He's going to end up making the transition in uh, 1913 with, um, with the Camel cigarette. But it's going to take a whole bunch of changes in his outlook and, his, um, and, and changes in the market for him to make that transition. In the 1890s, uh, there was a panic in 1893. And when that panic happened, he looked around, he thought about retiring. He was, only, he was about 43 at the time. He thought about retiring and uh, he said, you know, I, I want to take some big risks. And he spent the 1890s, even though the economy was beginning to tank, growing and growing and growing his company. Uh, he would go into big debt. He went into such debt to create more and more buildings and extend his market that his top management people left him. They just said, this man is crazy. But he was crazy like a fox because he ended up bringing in his younger uh, brothers and put them in charge of the company with him. He kept going into debt, kept growing. He got found that he was getting in some trouble by the late 1890s. And at that point, he went to James Buchanan Duke, the Duke of cigarette fame. And he went to James Buchanan Duke because Duke, since 1893, had been buying up with his American tobacco company, really a monopoly, had been buying up all the tobacco companies throughout the country. He had stayed away, Buck Duke had stayed away from R.J. Reynolds because he thought R.J. Reynolds was doing chewing tobacco. And that was old fashioned, that was a lower class clientele. He wasn't interested in this. He thought cigarettes and pipe tobacco were the way to go.
Um, but R.J. Reynolds, cagey like a fox, said, boy, I need, I need more capital here. I've gone into debt. I still want to grow my company. I need more capital. And what people didn't realize